Anybody? I bring notes because I'm a certain age that if I don't, my mind will begin to wonder. The Lord lays, like, sharing your testimony can be a daunting task because you open up about who you once were before Jesus saved you. And to share my own depravity with people I don't know that well that God might be glorified can be intimidating. As much as I desire to glorify God, there's still that fleshly need to be liked by people. And you find yourself walking a fine line that you're not glorifying the person or the sin, but that God is being praised. And that's the goal, and that's the reason I agreed to come up here today when Oscar asked me that in some way I might honor my Lord. At the age of 10, I met the man I'll consider my dad. He would be the third one I'd had in those few years. With this one, my mom had found a man that was not only good to her, but he was good to my sister and to me. And to a 10-year-old boy, he was larger than life. He was a Marine veteran who fought in World War II and Korea, and his stories about the Marines and combat left me in awe of him. He quickly became a hero to my sister and me. Growing up, we were not a church-going family, Sunday school, and Bible school and all the things that we take for granted just never was a big part of our life. I graduated high school on June 10th of 1984 and July 3rd I found myself standing on the parade deck at Paris Island because I wanted to be a Marine like my dad. Once we were assigned to our platoon and introduced to our drill instructors for training I quickly learned about my lack of knowledge about anything biblical. At the time when you were in Marine boot camp, before bed, the Catholics would go to one end of the squad bay and the Protestants would go to the other end of the squad bay for a nightly prayer. I wasn't sure if I was a Protestant, but I knew I wasn't a Catholic, so I went to the end with the Protestants. It was decided we would recite the Lord's Prayer nightly before bed. I'm not going to say I never heard the Lord's Prayer, but I sure didn't have it memorized. The first couple of nights I got by, by just sort of moving my lips, but after 12 weeks, I knew it word for word. And if I'm honest with y'all, it didn't mean any more to me on the 84th night than it did on the first night. It was just something I had memorized. I graduated from boot camp. I came home for 30 days, and then we flew to Camp Pendleton in California for infantry training school. Most everybody there was the same. 18 to 19 years old, fresh out of boot camp, cocky, arrogant, and loud. We would train all day, and then we would be set loose on the town that night. When I began to drink, I had no idea the impact it would make in my life. It's just what we did. No one starts out thinking this is going to become a problem. After my time in California, I was stationed on an aircraft carrier that sailed out of Norfolk, Virginia. It was in Norfolk that I first experienced blacking out from drinking. And it's ironic I remember that because blacking out is when you have no memory of what happened when you were drinking. This wouldn't be a one-time thing. It would happen more times than I could count over the next 15 years. Later on, when me and my wife Eleanor were dating, there would be times that I didn't want to call her on Saturday because I didn't remember what happened on Friday night. And I had no idea if we had parted ways on friendly terms 
or if I had become belligerent and she left mad. I completed my four years in the Marines and what we need to understand was I was doing is what we were all doing. I'm not blaming the core or I'm not blaming my environment. It's just what it was. There was no talks about problems. There was no talks about sin. There was, there was none of that. The only time God's name was used, it was used in vain. I was lost as I could be and out in the world. And I look back to those days and what we did. And it's like I didn't so much as pause to question the morality of any of it. After I got out, I came home and me and Eleanor began to date and I got a job in construction. And once again, the friends I surrounded myself with were just like me. There would be times when everything would be right at the edge of being out of control, and then there were times when it was completely out of control. My dad, the one I looked up to so much, came to me one evening to talk about it. And he told me that him and my mom were worried about me. And I assured him that I was fine and completely disregarded everything he had to say. And shortly afterwards, within a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, me and Eleanor were at a party together and I became angry at her, not really for any other reason than I was just drunk. And I left her there. I got into my small sports car I owned at the time, and several miles down the road, I drove into an intersection out in Millenport without so much as slowing down until it was too late. My car was T-boned on the driver's side door, and everything came to a crashing halt. I was two and a half miles from my home. My mom and my dad were there in an instance Someone brought Eleanor there. The man who owned the store that I joked around with all the time was the one that came running out to our cars. Some of my parents' neighbors were there. And within just a few minutes, they all knew what I'd done. I didn't know anything about God the night that wreck happened. But me and the lady I could have killed both got out of our cars without a scratch. The patrolman on the scene came over to me after he was finished with everything he had to do. And he told me he wasn't going to put me in handcuffs. And he would let me ride in the front seat because I'd been cooperative with him. My parents, my sister, my future wife, and my neighbors were all there when I got arrested that night. And that was over 30 years ago. But I remember two things that the officer said to me as we were driving toward the jail. First, he said that when he pulled up and seen the cars, he expected to find nothing but dead bodies. And then he looked at me and he said, the only reason you're not dead is God didn't want you tonight. He was exactly right, because if I'd have died that night, I'd be in hell today instead of talking to y'all. Sometime later, I had my day in court. I lost my license for a year and was put in jail for 24 hours. The night I spent in my cell, I listened to men scream and curse each other. And I'd like to say that was the turning point, but it wasn't. I did attempt to pray that night, listening to these men screaming, but I didn't pray for forgiveness and I didn't admit any sin. Instead, I prayed the prayer of negotiation God, if you'll get me out of here, then I'll do something. I imagine the devil gets a real kick out of these kind of prayers. I got out the next day, and within a week, I was right back at it. Nothing had changed except Al, Eleanor was stuck driving me around. And believe it or not, after all I'd put her through, she still wanted to marry me. We were married in October of 1992. 
Our first son was born in August of 94, and our second son was born in April of 96. And in the midst of all these blessings, I don't know if I ever thank God even once. Travis would be eight, and Jacob would be six before they were ever at a Sunday morning service. I look back now, and I realize my God lived in a bottle. He lived in a can, and I loved him. And I can see how much of my life revolved around the next drink. I can remember standing in my kitchen after everyone had gone to bed with the refrigerator door open in an otherwise dark room counting how many cans I had left from the case I bought on my way home from work. Mad at myself because I had drank in a couple of hours what was supposed to get me through the whole weekend. Even then, if you would have asked me, I would have denied there was a problem. This was our life. And I mean, we were happy in the world. A lost sinner doesn't know any different. If I had met any one of you then, you wouldn't know the difference. I would have kept it away from you. In March of 2000, everything changed. In a hospital room in Charlotte, I watched the strongest man I had ever known die. My dad was gone. And standing in that room with Eleanor, my mom and my sister, I felt completely alone. And what the wreck couldn't do, or my arrest, or my marriage, or the birth of my sons, watching my father die caused me, possibly for the first time in my entire life, to give thought to God. For the briefest of moments, I realized I had no idea what happens after you die. I'm happy to say both my parents had gotten saved later on in life. We were married in my mom and dad's church by their pastor. I didn't know it at the time and wouldn't have believed it anyway, but with the death of my father, the Holy Spirit was about to do a work in my life. It wouldn't be until I look back and understand that there are no coincidences with God that I could see his hand moving. Shortly after my father's funeral, we signed our sons up to play t-ball at the park in Norwood, and Eleanor became friends with another mom. And Wendy's a godly woman who was very active in her church, and along with her husband, Steve, they became a big influence in my family's life. She was the one God would use to minister to us early. She invited Eleanor to church and got our boys in Bible school and I'm convinced she had people praying for us we didn't even know. Along that same time, for some unknown reason, me and Eleanor were at our local library, and I ran across a book that was titled Left Behind, which is about the rapture of the church and what those left behind are going to deal with. Listen, all, all this stuff about Jesus coming back and for the church and people being left by here, there's a lot, of, a lot that people don't know. I didn't know. I know this, from the time my dad died, everywhere I turned, God, Jesus was there. We went to family night at the end of Bible school, and we met some nice people. But believe me when I say I wasn't expecting anything more. Nothing had changed at home. The drinking hadn't stopped. After a couple of weeks, we finally went to church on a Sunday morning. Preacher Mark Mabry was preaching from the Ten Commandments, doing a commandment one a week. I had never heard anything like that. I could hear it. I could understand what he was talking about. We went back the next Sunday and the next. Faith comes by hearing the hearing by the Word of God sermons on sin and on repentance and on salvation and I was being drawn out of the world I thought I loved and toward a God I never acknowledged for 16 years almost half of my life at the time alcohol was at the center of it 
I based my friends on it. Our weekends were guided by it. Where would we go? Who we would hang out with? What we would do? I never considered quitting because I didn't want to. Not for my wife, not for my kids. It had complete control. And then it was gone. He just took it. And everything that went with it. The need for it, the planning around it, the desire, it was just gone. I love the verse that says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. In September of 2000, I came to the altar at Calvary Baptist Church, and Pastor Mark led me in a prayer. And a little while later, he told me, Brother, you were saved before you ever came down that aisle. God saved me by the precious blood of his Son that he might be glorified today. By his grace, he gave me teaching as a spiritual gift, and I thirst for his word now. And I'll leave you with this from 2 Corinthians, because this is me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Thank you.